Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the OmniTalk Spotlight Series, where we highlight the people, the technologies, and the companies that are shaping the future of retail. Today I'm excited because we are joined by Julian Mills, the CEO and founder of Corso. I think this is going to be a special episode today because, you know, based on our background and in Maya's background, you know, it's a background that is a blend of both HQ experience in retail, but also experience being out in the field. And I think sometimes those two worlds collide. And now more than ever, they're probably colliding under COVID. So how people can effectively manage through all the different situations that a retailer faces and all the different perspectives that come from seeing things both on the front lines and within an HQ operation can be really important. So to talk about that further with us today is a country that, excuse me, is a company that I think is really interesting on the scene. And again, that is Corso. So Julian, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. Yeah, it's awesome having you. So I always joke with the end. So we've had this happen one time before, but you know, aside from you being a Stanford graduate, which automatically qualifies you as being pretty <laughs> awesome. Shout out to Stanford right here for those watching our video with my Stanford <laughs> mug. Your background's really unique. So before we get to Corso, talk, talk a little bit about it. So you've got a long consulting background with McKinsey. You know, who are you and, and how did you come to the point where you founded a, uh, the company that you did? Sure, Chris. So um, it's, it's been a strange path. So I grew up on a remote Scottish island surrounded by sheep. Yeah, lots of otters, lots of seals, 11 right. miles to the nearest village. Um, and I realized in the late 90s that I was in danger of living about 2,000 years behind the times. And so I jumped on a plane to the valley and got a job at a fast growing data analytics business, which was a lot of fun. I mean, total culture shock. Um, and that was great, worked with companies like Amazon in the early days. Really? And then about 2000, the party stopped and I thought time to get a real job. So I left and joined McKinsey, where I stayed on and off for about the next 14, 15 years um, and was a partner and did kind of turnarounds in the retail and travel sector. Um, and I think the thing that struck me time and time again was I kept on working with really smart companies that had gleaming headquarters full of smart people doing amazing things. And they've been collecting more and more data for the last decade. And they had felt, or they at least felt they had all the answers in their brains in these gleaming headquarters. Mm -hmm. But when you went out and walked around and looked in stores, the stores were running the same way as they were 20 years ago. And so there was this fundamental mismatch between kind of clever ideas in the center and the kind of day-to-day -day operations of the business. And the question I had was like, how do you actually get a thousand stores to do the right thing at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning using that data. And that's really why we found it cool. So I'm curious, Julian, was there a fundamental moment for you where you kind of sensed that? Like, do you remember back in your career? I always, I always find these types of moments interesting where like you were, you had a certain experience working with a client or walking through a store where you saw that and it was really palpable for the first time. Like when did, when did that actually hit you? Yeah. So um, I, I think the first occasion, actually, I was working with a big car rental firm. Okay. And they had about three, 4,000 too many cars scattered across about 150, 200 different branches. Um, and we could see them in the data. But when we rang up the branch managers and said, hey, can you send these cars back on the load loader? They just wouldn't. And so there was this fundamental disconnect between the answers at the center and people on the ground who didn't really understand why it was important to do that and so didn't comply. Yeah. Yeah, I can. can you remember that? I mean, I can remember that too, where that would happen. I can remember like going and running a store for the first time and just thinking you you understood how it worked. And then, you know, you know, saying, okay, hey, I got this HQ perspective. I'm going to come in here. I've got to figure out how all these planograms need to be set and all that. And then it's like, whoa, wait a second. There's some pretty big complexities here in terms of trying to get the labor to do everything and, and to the letter of detail that's probably expected at HQ relative to what actually is really possible. Or they didn't even get out to the floor. Right. <laughs> you, you, you spend months working on this campaign and it's like, oh, it's, uh, it's still in the back. In, yeah, in the, the, mark, the, the marketing so, is the fun. It's with yeah. that. Yeah. And, and, so, and, and that resonates so much. I and mean, one thing I hear all the time from retailers is, you know, we're a month behind with our planograms or, mm -hmm. you know, 45% of the kind of initiatives we action from the center get implemented. I mean, I think compliance in store is really, really low. And it's not because people aren't being instructed what to do. It's just because it, we're not showing them why they should do it. We're not making it meaningful to folks. We're not kind of making it exciting. That makes sense. Well, and it also seems too, Julian, like there's, there's not a, at least when we were at, at some the headquarters that I worked at for a larger mm -hmm. retailer, there's not that open line of communication where the headquarters is really getting that feedback unless they're 
uh, boots on the ground going into the stores and seeing that firsthand for themselves. So I think yeah, that's what, one thing I'm curious about too is, as, especially as we start to look at what's happening now in stores and with COVID, is, is there, you know, a moment that, you know, Corso has kind of looked at this as, you know, this is something that was happening pre-COVID that's now kind of transformed or that, that you're really seeing an application for Corso um, helping the stores or helping that line of communication between headquarters and stores now more than ever? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the pandemic has made three things happen. And I'm interested to hear your views on this. I think the first one of those is, you know, demand is much more lumpy. And so people have to respond much more quickly yeah, to, to what's going on in different stores. The second thing is obviously demand is down and so there's pressures on cost. So you need to run stores in a more lean way. Um, and I think the third one is this increasing awareness of just the kind of human cost and the human stress on store colleagues um, of you know, showing up for work every day and you know, doing their job. And so it's that kind of agility that kind of efficiency and that um, that kind of human dimension, which I think we at Corso very much speak to. Um, and then I think it's that that's kind of exciting people about what we do at the moment. I think, yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that too, Julie, because I, I think there's even a fourth element that I would add to that, I think within the context, and I, I want to ask you about it specifically too, which is I think so much of us as humans, we rely on what we're able to see with the human eye. And so, and I think of when you start thinking about store operations and the efficiency and how well it's done and being to manage and being able to manage people, especially in different stores and different states, depending on how big the operation is, COVID is putting a challenge on that. You can't actually be everywhere that you were normally accustomed to be. And that makes it difficult on you psychologically. It makes you difficult, makes it difficult to go on you operationally because that's how you're used to doing things. But I mean, I think that, and that's fundamentally why we asked you guys to come on the show too. So like, how do you fit into that? What does Corso do in order to facilitate that conversation execution happening day to day? Yeah, sure. So um, the easiest way to explain what Corso does, it, it's an intelligent management platform for stores. Okay. Okay? So what happens is that you as a VP stores or store ops um, specify the seven or eight, nine, 10 things that you really care about in a particular week. So think of them as kind of traditional KPIs. I want to sell more bananas or I want to reduce overtime or whatever it is. Corso then hunts through all of your data and generates four to five personalized next best actions for every um, store manager or member of the store leadership. Okay. And it shows them the four or five things that they could do each day that would have the biggest impact against those seven or eight KPIs, okay? And it then measures the actions that they take, tracks to check they're delivered, measures the financial improvement associated with that, and then plays back to the store colleague with their, their personal contribution to the performance of the business. Yeah? So to give you a specific example of that, say you said, I want to drive, um, I want to drive sales, a very high level one. You know, it might say, Hey, Anne, you know, you should be able to sell an extra 2000 bucks of bananas by, you know, restocking at between 10 and 11 on a Tuesday morning. Um, it would then track whether you did that, measure the improvement associated with it, and then go, hey, congrats, Anne, you did that. You know, you've personally contributed an extra 2000 bucks this week to the performance of this. So let me double click into that because I think that's important. So, and so tell me if this is correct. Mm -hmm. So like, because of the way I'm envisioning this and I'm, I'm putting back to my district manager hat, I'm like, let's say I had 12, for me, I had 12 target stores under my charge. Yeah. So all the data would come in on a given week and I'd be sitting there in front of my computer, probably likely to have a conference call with my team that morning to actually tell them what all those priorities are, which yeah. for the most part was probably more qualitative them telling me each other these things back and forth. But what you're saying instead is that there's almost a software suite of tools where I can go onto this platform. We get all the data. We all see it the same way. And yeah. then based on what the data is that's powering everything behind it, it can make recommendations that I and my store managers can have conversations about on this platform and choose to follow. And then it can document what our choices are. And then we can follow up on those week to week to see if they're actually moving the needle to the degree uh, that we hope they are. So in your case, like, restocking the bananas, so to speak. Yeah. That's how that fundamentally works. Yeah, but it's much cooler than that. 
Um, Sweet. So. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> even better. So I thought that was cool already. That is cool. That's cool. No but more it's even conference better. calls. <laughs> exactly. So Monday morning, eight o'clock, you wake up, or well, seven o'clock, you wake up over your coffee. You look at your phone and Courses basically gives you a readout of how you performed last week in your store, but also the four or five areas that you might want to try and do better in this week. Okay. So say one of them might be, I don't know, um, you know, breaded poultry. I'm going to try and sell an extra 2000 bucks worth of breaded poultry because that's under trading, you know, relative to other stores, just like me. I might look into that. I might look at the suggestions in Corso, log an action, log a plan. Um, and then, you know, head off to work. Meanwhile, my area manager is seeing all of those kind of suggested actions flowing up to them. And so when they log in at say 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, they can see that there are 60, 70 different actions their team are taking to try and drive sales that way. Okay. They can look through those 57 of them. They'll go, that's great. Leave you to it. Three of them they'll look at and they'll go, that particular store manager needs a little bit of help. And so they'll well wade in, they can coach them through the platform, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, by the end of the day, everyone's taking their actions. They're trying to improve the business. And then essentially, if you roll forward as the week goes on, Corsa will then inform you how each of those missions or actions is actually trying to improve. So to go, hey, congratulations, Chris. Yep, you're selling an extra 15% breaded poultry. You're up X thousand um, as of Thursday. And it'll give you that kind of instant feedback of how the actions that you're taking in your store are driving the improvement of the business. And that's the key part, because I think that's what's so fundamentally important about this is that then you start the conversation as a manager and a direct report at whatever level, whatever level in the organization on the same foundation. So the way it happens now is everyone's going off and doing that themselves. And then they're having this arbitration to say, here's what I want to focus on. Here's what, what do you think I should focus on? And that's happening so disparately. This is now everyone starts from the same point and you can still have your conference calls. You can still have your phone calls with the people running your stores to say, Hey, this is what we saw. Uh, you know, this is what we saw through the system today. This is what the data is telling us. What do you think about this? Do you agree or not? Here's what I think about it. Here's how we should monitor it. And then let's track it week to week. You don't have that central foundational footing otherwise without something the likes of which you're talking about. Yeah, I, that's right. And I think also think about the kind of information you pick up from recording that. So, right. you know, if, if one of your team, you say you're an area manager, Chris, and if one of your team says, hey, you know, I can't sell more bread at poultry, well, your ability to kind of turn around and go, well, look, 27 of your colleagues have actually sold an extra 5% last week. Do you see what I mean? You can actually have a kind of fact-based conversation the way you're describing mm -hmm. um, to try and challenge some of these kind of assertions that we all make when we're just being a little bit out of the Right. Have you done this? Have you put it here? Have you restocked it during these times of the day? Right. Like what, you know, what price do you have it at? All those different types of things. Yeah. You should be able to see that yeah. across that conversation but week to week. Yeah. And, and Chris, I think the most important bit of this, which we haven't really talked about is, you know, we go to work and we work hard, but actually we don't get much feedback on how we're doing. Yeah. Right. Whereas now, you know, you can use a fitness app and you can track how many steps you take, how many hours you sleep, how many calories you eat, et cetera. And what we're doing with courses is we're showing you how every action you take is actually helping you be better at your job and helping you make the business you work at better. And so I think that that is a really, really exciting very cool kind of progression, which is we're showing people the meaning of their day-to-day -day work life. Yeah. And everyone's on the same page of what that progress means. And so it's that kind of lateral spreading of best practice and insight, which is also really important. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's important to talk about too, because I think that there's the, the, the streamline of communications elements that keeps everyone on the same page here, where you know, I've seen companies right now trying to do that with like using Twitter for that, for example, like, yeah. you know, here are the actions I'm taking to drive the sales in my store so they can get attention. Meanwhile, they're telling the whole world about it. And sometimes the things you want to communicate aren't necessarily things you want sitting on Twitter. Um, yeah. So that's, that is, that is that fundamentally what you're kind of describing yeah. there too, in terms it, of making it, that faster? Yeah, it, it is. But I think there's a fundamental difference. So there's a okay. lot of collaboration tools that enable you to speak very quickly across the organization. Right. But the problem is a lot of them pedal, bad medicine yeah okay so there are lots of people who kind of say oh i figured out how to do this but it turns out they haven't yeah what corso does is it links the data the actual proven improvement yeah mm -hmm. to the collaboration so that you know whether to trust that particular piece of best practice or advice you're getting from someone because you can link it back to an improvement in sales or reduction in cost that's does that make sense 
It does. It's not just the loudest voice on Twitter or the most charismatic person in the organization talking to a leader saying this thing matters. It's actually then grounded in the data to show whether or not it matters, which that was always frustrating for us too, because like my boss would go on a store visit with somebody else and this really charismatic person would say he or she's doing this and it's so great. And then it, that leader would love it and he'd tell all of us to do it. And we'd be like, like that, what that, we're not even sure that person knew what, she, what he or she was talking about. So, yeah. yeah, no, that actually makes a ton of sense. Here's a really interesting, scary stat for you. Okay. So when we start working with companies, we typically find that only 55% of a manager's actions actually drive improvement. Yeah. So 45% of the time, they actually destroy value. Yeah. So it's just better than 50-50. You know, by the time they've been working with us for a couple of months, it's at 80% drive value. Yeah. So there is this kind of problem that a lot of organizations are running on kind of false information, to be honest. Yeah, it gets a little bit of the kind of the money ball theory of, you know, like how, you know, scouting in baseball or sports works too, is what you think you know with the naked eye versus what you actually know with data. I think that's, you know, kind of the key theme running through here too, which, yeah, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, 50-50 chance on, on probably being right. Well, Julian, what, so now that, now that we are in COVID, like Ann mentioned, what, what are examples that you're seeing right now where mm -hmm. companies have had to pivot, say, particularly to new metrics or new processes that they hadn't needed to think about before, where this type of concept or idea could be really useful in helping them rally the teams around those types of things? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great question. So we see two directions that, that retailers are going in. The first okay. is obviously BOPUS. You know, so we're seeing a lot of people saying, actually, now we have to kind of run a fundamentally different operation at significant scale, and we don't quite know how to do that. And by the way, our traditional reporting lines are focusing on kind of classic store metrics. You know, so the team doing BOPUS, et cetera, isn't necessarily getting the kind of support and the help that they would get um, or that, 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 that they would expect. So we are doing quite a lot of work with organizations who are looking to use Corso to help drive um, effectively store fulfillment for BOPUS, yeah? Um, I think the second thing we're seeing quite a lot is organizations saying, uh, we need to rethink our area management, yeah? So we're gonna increase spans of control. Mm. You know, we can't always go and visit the stores in person because they're in lockdown or, or whatever. So how do we manage stores remotely at this time? Mm. And we're doing a lot in that area. And how, how is the platform learning these new or, or kind of coming up with the data and kind of refining the data to support something that's completely new for one of your, your partners, Julian? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. So, I mean, the platform basically connects to um, your, raw, um, your, your raw data set. So your POS data, you know, your core operational metrics, you can kind of put anything into that. And then really it's very simple for you as a user to kind of steer it to the areas you want to um, focus on. So you could say, I want to focus on this. It would take about five seconds to kind of change the focus. Okay. Um, once you do that, it then starts to kind of learn from the thousands of actions your team is taking day in, day out to try and improve it. So you build this kind of playbook as you go along. But the initial direction comes from, you know, the retailer's team actually saying, this is what we want to focus on. So taking in just, data inputs and then the human inputs that are coming from all of the, the responses that you're getting from the platform and, and from the, the field. Yeah, exactly. And so I mean, if you think about a typical large retailer, if you wrote down every action that a manager takes on a piece of paper, you'd have a stack taller than the US capital, right. you know, within a year. So where, where is that? Where is that data? Yeah. Where, where, where is that stack of paper? You know, that's what we're recording in the app. You know, right. the, the efforts of humans to try and drive the performance of that particular store or that particular company. Which is, which is something that I think is important too, as you start to incorporate technology into these teams where it's actually supplementing the teams, it sounds like, versus just taking and using data alone or collected data from the platform alone to make those decisions. Yeah, and that's right. We think, we think people are amazing. You know, I'm always staggered by how innovative you know, how motivated, how, you know, forward thinking, you know, people are in store. And really all we're trying to do, you know, very humbly is actually record the amazing things they're doing, work out which ones are successful in driving better performance, and then scale those up across the organization. Yeah. And give greater visibility to the data so that better decisions can be made across exactly. the board. Right.
Well, that, and I, that's inspiring too, in a lot of ways, because I think, you know, we always, I always talk about what are the three ingredients of, you know, job satisfaction, autonomy, complexity, and attachment. And, you know, the more you can give, more you can create tools that enable autonomy or confidence in the decision-making that one is making. And then the, therefore the freedom to just go out and do their work without the, you know, what can be at times exhausting management oversight into what's happening at those levels, you know, the more happy people are going to be. Um, Julian, getting back to that question, uh, or, give, or getting back to your last statement too, I'm curious, are you seeing, you talked about Bobus, which is 100% the topic du jour of mm. the day. Are you seeing the metrics or KPIs that retailers are using start to shift that are leveraging your type, your type of thought process as well? I mean, I imagine they would be because that's a whole, you know, different set of criteria and metrics by which you would evaluate success versus a typical day-to-day -day operation. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I mean, interested to hear your thoughts too, Chris. What we're seeing is not that people are coming up with new metrics, but okay. that certain metrics are achieving higher prominence. Got it. That makes yeah. sense. Yep. So it's the operational metrics around fulfillment, you know, accuracy, you know, um, cycle times, that kind of stuff that are getting prominence. They've been there for a long time. It's just that they haven't been top of the pecking. Yeah, not so much for retail, right? Like it, they've always yeah. been there for certain types of businesses that are in the takeout or pickup space, yeah. but not necessarily like yeah. where your business has been core filling shelves day in and day out. That makes sense. But yeah. so this helps you to see that effectively. Yes. Got yeah. it. Okay. Uh, that, that totally makes sense. Uh, so for, to Anne's point, I think the other thing she was making me think of, like it's all, it's, I mean, it's all easy to say kind of, you know, in a, the ethereal world that we live in here with podcasting and talking about technology of like, okay, this makes sense. It helps people communicate. It helps streamline priorities around data. Mm -hmm. But how easy is it to do this? Like, what does an implementation typically look like if a retailer says, hey, I'm buying into this. This makes <laughs> sense. It's COVID. I got to get better at this. I got to make my people do more with less, so to speak. How hard is this to put into practice? Yeah. Um, so there are two components to that. There's the kind of data setup. Okay. And there's the, you know, implementation and rollout. Okay. Yeah. So um, on the data setup, depending on the state your data's in, we could set you up in anything between three hours um, okay. for, for point of sale data okay. um, and three weeks. Okay, so it's very, very quick. And I'm continually pushing our team down to the point, in fact, we're getting pretty close to it now where you will go, be able to go onto our website and drag and drop your point of sale data or some of your point of sale data into the app and it will immediately set you up and you can be up and running in a couple of hours. Okay. So that's the kind of data side, which is pretty easy, pretty quick. We've invested a lot of effort in that. Um, if you think about the kind of rollout and implementation, you know, this is either very easy or you need a bit of help. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. sorry, it's, it's a bit of a spectrum. Technically it's very easy. If you can use Airbnb, you can use Corsa, yeah? So um, we stop training people, people get it, 98% of people are activated within two weeks. You know, 94% of people, you know, use it every day, every week, et cetera. Um, where it gets hard is if your organization isn't used to running in this kind of way. Mm. Because if you think about it, we're bringing a degree of science to how you run your business. And if your business is run for, you know, years on who shouts loudest or you know, what the boss thinks, then in a sudden, you know, we're, we're actually changing the culture of your organization. And I think, you know, most organizations really like that and they move very quickly, but there are others that we're just not right for. And I think we're, we're pretty transparent about that. Yeah, I think the, the takeaway for me for there too, is if you actually think about undergoing a transformation, this is potentially something you actually want to think about as a foundation to making that happen because it can yes. start the platform for that conversation, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Interesting stuff. Um, okay, well, I th that has been a great conversation. I think I, it's got my head spinning. I think there's a ton of applicability here, as you can tell. Like, I think there's just having worked in in both HQ and, and the field, there's there's a lot of space within within which to grow in terms of I think the topics we're talking about. But we cannot let you get out of here without doing, of course, what is our signature here at Omni Talk, which is our game. How millennial are you? Are you ready, Julian? I am, but I can tell you the answer now. Oh, really? <laughs> what is it? 
Not very, 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 very far away. We're just going to skip ahead. We're not even going to, not even going to go there. And Julie, before we do this, we should have said in the beginning, where are you calling from today? Where are we, where are we yeah, speaking yeah. of you from today? For, forgive me. So I, I usually live on a plane somewhere between New York and, and, and London, but at the moment I'm on the English Riviera in the beautiful <laughs> county of Dorset. I look out of my window and I can see palm trees and dolphins and porpoises and that kind of stuff. It's great. You should come here when, when lockdown lifts. That's been, and putting that in point of perspective, how far is that from the channel? I'm just curious. <laughs> um, it's about uh, about 10 miles away. So 10 know, miles, like, all right. We're 10 miles from the shuttle. All right. The we have, we have nice, nice beaches job. here. Yeah, one day in three. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, Anne, you ready for this? Yes, I am ready. Julian, are you ready? I am. Okay. So the first question is, when you are going to pay for groceries, what have you, are you pulling out a credit card or are you using some form of mobile payment? Yeah, so I use a contactless debit or credit card most of the time, or debit card. Um, the reason is I do have banking on my phone, but I lose my phone a lot. <laughs> so my card is more reliable. Well, I think the question of why you're losing your phone a lot is another one we can explore, <laughs> which actually might make you more millennial than anyone that we've talked sure. to who, uh, yes, no, that, so contactless card, so you're just tapping yeah. to pay. You just yeah. tap your card. Okay. Yeah. Which is All pretty right. prevalent over there, right? Like a lot of people do that now, right? Yeah. 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 We d that is not taken off over in the States. Like, I don't, I don't think I've even ever seen anyone do that. Have you seen anyone do that? Mm, no, I've tried to do it and not been able to Not so that's successful. funny too yeah that <laughs> that, that makes that that pushes me to the end of the millennial spectrum board. more just hitting technology expecting it to work you know that sort of it's thing. also saying julian still has a wallet which is the other like subtle oh, subtle man. piece there that yes. we're, we're we're finding out here All right let's give them a chance to answer a couple more questions maybe maybe uh hold on to that millennial status i think he's doing all right so far all right um okay julian in the last week how many times have you ordered food or drinks from an app well, so last week wasn't typical. Um, it was zero, but normally about three times. Okay. Um, Where, what are your go-tos? So I order my lunch. You know, if, I, if I'm working out of the office, I would order my lunch um, on, on an app, go and pick it up. Um, and then Uber Eats, you okay. know, people like that I use too. All right. All right. What about, do you use the Starbucks app? No, I don't. I should do. That, so you're a Starbucks drinker, but don't use the app. I love Starbucks, but um, I don't use the app. And it always annoys me when someone queue jumps um, who has used the app. So I should just get with it. Oh my God, uh, you're, like, you're like a needle in a stack of needles, a Starbucks <laughs> that doesn't use the app. <laughs> I know, I, I think there should be, I would love to see the data on that alone. Cause I think it's yeah. fascinating. That's, I don't, I don't think you're alone. I think there's actually more people than we realize, um, but it's so widely used here that. Yeah. And people do get mad too. Like I've, I've, I've been on stage giving presentations where people will tell me how mad they are that I've jumped the line when I talk about the fact that you can jump the line. So, but I, the one thing I'm curious about Julian, which you'll have to tell us at a later date is if you try it, will you ever go back? And my hunch is no, <laughs> you will not okay, go back. I'll, I'll let you know in a week's time. All okay. right, sounds good. All right, last question, Julian. If you could only use one social platform, yeah. which would it be and why? Good question. So, um. I, I would go for LinkedIn. I know it's not very cool, but um, I, I find it a bit more thematic, interesting content. I find Twitter just kind of messes with my brain. There's too much information coming at me. Um, and I think I'm being steered by the Russians. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't say that. And, um, and then I guess if I would call out one other piece of technology, I think WhatsApp. I know it's not a social platform, but mm -hmm. WhatsApp, oh, I just yeah, think is a brilliant piece of software. It's so functional. It's so easy to use. It's just brilliant. What, tell us more. Why do you like it so much? Because we have heard that a couple times, but it, it's unique, but it's definitely a social platform. So yeah, what, what makes you say that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, someone who, who builds, pro, who's building a product, um, yeah. what is interesting about WhatsApp is there is nothing that diverts you really from your core task, but it supports all of the core tasks that you want and it just works time in, time out. And you never really have that kind of experience where they do a major upgrade and you have to relearn it. It's just so intuitive. It's so easy to use. You know, I aspire for what we do at Corsair to be as easy and fun as WhatsApp. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good way to get you out of here too, because I think the fundamental takeaway for me is almost thinking of store management as a product. 
like yeah. that's fundamentally what you're saying here, which is, you know, how do we manage a store similar to how we'd manage a piece of software or how would we manage, you know, the product side of it all coming together day to day and using data to drive our decision making in terms of how we make it work better for those that are using and experience it, uh, experiencing it on, on, on an ongoing basis. So I think yeah, that's the, the tenor and theme. And quite frankly, that's the tenor and theme of almost everything we talk about. That's why we're called OmniTalk because I think it's about building the, the omni-channel product for the future uh, as it comes to retailing. So, well, awesome, Julian. That was great. Hey, if people like this conversation, if they <clears throat> want to learn more, if they want to get in touch with you, like what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. So um, three easy ways to do that. You know, either message me on LinkedIn um, or go to our website and get in touch. Or you can even email me at julian.mills at corso.com. Um, that's julian.mills. Um, please don't send me any invitations, though, to rescue your Nigerian um, friend who's <laughs> languishing in prison. And could be safe if I give you 20,000 bucks. <laughs> That's awesome. We've never heard that before. And for those, for those two, Corso spelled Q-U-O-R-S-O -O as well, if you're looking for that online. Great. Well, hey, again, thank you so much, Julian. It's been wonderful having you on, on the show. Again, that's Julian Mills, the CEO and founder of Corso. On behalf of Anne and to all of you out there, as we say at the conclusion of every show, and it's as important now as it ever has been, and that is be careful out there.